Hey, from uh, Mork Saloon here. We are going to show you today how to make a butternut squash soup. It's delicious. If you've never done it, you owe it to yourself to try it. Uh, it's a very alkalizing food. It's a very uh, good for you. It elevates your pH and it's, it's a, one of those vegetables that's healthy and hearty and not that expensive. Um, I think I paid a dollar a pound for these guys and that's in New York at the farmers market so you might be able to do it even better in the suburbs. And these are organic um, and so should yours if you care about what you're putting in your face. Um, anyway, so uh, just want to start with the actual squash because they come in various shapes and sizes and uh, these are probably two of the more varied shapes you can get. This is this is pretty unusual. This is a little more normal. Uh, although this has a pretty big head on it. So the reason we want to show you is when you prepare these things you got to peel off the... Uh, some people say to bake them to get the peel off. Now I'm not into that because if you overcook your food you might as well not cook anything. I mean it's... the food value drops for every 30 minutes you process your food. So the goal here is to get the peel off so we don't have to cook them for as long because that actually retains more of the nutrition that's in the food. Uh, so that's my point. Um, so we, we, we're going to choose this one today because it's the one that's going to be harder to prepare. So I'm going to pick the harder one to show you how I would prepare something like this one, this shape. Uh, so we're going to put this one away because that's very easy and you'll know in a minute uh, why it's easy once I start showing you how to cut this thing. Um, for this much butternut squash, which is about, what, three pounds or something, you'd use about an onion. And you can use a twice as big onion. It really it's not an overpowering thing and onion's good for you so if you have a little more onion just put a whole onion in that's a little bigger it's fine uh, and then uh, salt and pepper of course get the salt here it's quite simple it's really a 20 minute job to do this um, we have uh, mineral salt here anybody who's seen the other videos will know I talk about my mineral salt quite a bit uh, it's got all the trace minerals that salt normally has. It has not been depleted, like regular table salt has been depleted of many of the minerals that were originally in the salt. Uh, you actually want all these trace minerals when you eat your salt. So get some good sea salt or the Himalayan salt that we have here. It's got pink. It's pink not because it's colored, but because there's actually minerals in here. It's like the periodic table in a bag, you know. So you want this. Uh, it's, it's chemistry for your body. It al alkalizes you and keeps your all your systems operating well. So uh, by all means, have some salt. now. Having spoken about salt, keep in mind that we're also going to put bouillon in there so you don't want to over salt it because you're going to get some salt from your bouillon too. I always remember that. Um, we don't have a lot of processed foods in this house, but this is one of them, and we do believe in this stuff. It is organic, otherwise, we wouldn't be touching it. Um, but it's extremely convenient, it sits in the refrigerator, and um, you know, it even says reduce sodium, which big deal there. But uh, to taste, you figure out how much salt you need to add to make it happen. And as far as ingredients, obviously if you're vegan you're not going to touch this, but um, chicken meat natural juices, maltodextrin, salt chicken stock, cane sugar, chicken fat, potato starch, yeast extract, di dried onion, dried garlic, some turmeric, and natural flavor. Uh, for a occasional processed food, that's, that's okay by my standards. So uh, that goes in there. And uh, what we're going to do next then is, is really process this thing, because cutting this thing is going to be the biggest job you're going to endure with this. Um, so um, I'm going to put some of these things away, because dealing with your butternut squash is something you got to definitely don't drink wine while you're processing butternut squash. I mean, drink wine with other cooking, but not this. This is like, you know, sushi chef type orchestration. So uh, let me show you what we have going on. You need a good knife, period. Like, not too flimsy, because it weighs something. It's like a good dumbbell, you know, it, it, it's got that kind of weight to it. So you need something that can stand up against that. And here's a good sort of heavy knife. It's just well in the hand. So you need that to get the whole thing started. And then you want a smaller knife for the finer work, the one that you're happy with, that you can... It's a little slippery in there, so you need, you need the knives that don't slip in your hand. You know, we, we, we've got another knife in here that I don't use for this purpose, because this one it tends to slip and you could slide onto the... so this is for dry dry purposes, this is the one I use for butternut squash and other slightly slimy purposes. Um, and then we have this contraption which is actually a, a Northern European, Danish to be exact, a potato peeler that I uh, have used since I could barely walk and uh, therefore I'm comfortable using that on my butternut squash. I'll show you how to use that, I'll show you how to use the American peeler 
and you'll basically have an option of using this system, the American peeler system, or this system for getting the peel off. So we'll give you three options, then you can find out what you're most comfortable with. Now, first things first, we wash the squash. And these are winter squashes, you know, they last months. We had one, we brought it to Hawaii with us because we thought we were going to die if we didn't have a soup. Um, so we actually brought one in a bag uh, to Hawaii in uh, December. And in April the squash was still sitting on the counter because it hadn't really been cold enough in Hawaii to eat the soup. It sat there nicely on the counter and it was absolutely unscathed. Um, in fact, let me show you what they do on their own. If, if you kind of make a nick in it, they actually start to repair themselves with a little sort of butternut scar tissue thing. So they'll last for you. So I have not seen one of these go bad. Um, but that's not to say I don't know if they're going to last six months. I only had one sitting for three months, but that should get you through most of the winter. So you can go ahead and stock up in the fall. If you're not comfortable with that or you don't have space for that, you can actually cut them up into little chunks like we're going to show you now. And then you can put those in a Ziploc, put those in the freezer, and then you have the chunks ready for soup whenever you want. So that's another option for storing your butternut squash. But by all means, pick them up when they're in season, which is in the fall, and, and uh, help yourself because they're inexpensive and they're delicious. Uh, I'm going to grab a towel to wipe my hands off because... I want to start this job with fairly dry hands, given what I just told you about slightly, slightly slimy food, uh, food. So the back end is the one that doesn't have the stem, right? That's pretty obvious. Uh, and that's relevant because there's a few seeds in a butternut squash, and they're always going to be in the bulb closest to the bottom. So when you get past this curve, you know that's your seed part in here, right here in this, in this area. So um, we're going to first cut off the ends, but then we're going to focus on getting this stuff out. So first, you you basically want to make sure you, you, you process a butternut squash in the order in which you're not going to get yourself stuck in a corner with an unruly uh, vegetable. So now you have a good grip on it, so you can cut the ends off right now. You don't want to wait on that until you have it cut in half and you can't maneuver around. So there you go. That's the other end. So now we're going to spin it back to the pod, the seed pod end. We're going to cut it right about here. Take it off right here. And the easiest thing is really to plant your knife in the, in the squash, and then you twist the squash. Instead of trying to cut with a knife, you actually just hold the knife and twist the squash, because that, that's much easier on you and, and everything else. So there we go. That's the first part. Now, so that's your bottom. Now we're going to cut through this, and you'll see the seeds. Voila. There we go. So there they are. And you can see there's no seed up here, and there, there will be no more seeds. So, so that tells you... If you have one shaped kind of like the one I showed you before, once you get the seed off, you've got a nice straight highway here to, to take care of. So uh, this is a good squash. If you can find something of this shape, you're, you're in good shape. The less curves, the better. I'm going to take a little spoon here and we'll just scoop the seeds out. Now, I wouldn't put these through the juicer if you juice. That's like not really... I don't believe this is real juice material. Of course, Master Stewart has a recipe that has you cooking butter on squash all day long. Of course, she has you like roasting the seeds and then, you know, grinding them up and whatnot and this and that. You know, it takes 20 minutes to make butternut squash soup, people. So, unless you really have a day to do it, don't listen to Martha. Sorry, Martha. Um, let's take these guys out. There we go. So far, so good, yeah? We actually don't need this for anything. So now I'm a little bit, so just kind of wash your hands periodically to get that little, it's not very slimy, but it just has that, it's a little like pumpkin, you know, when you have that little sort of greasy feeling. Now, uh, as far as peeling, if you're comfortable using these peelers here, you can just go ahead and cut this in two pieces. Uh, if you're not comfortable with that, you would probably cut it in smaller slices. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a combination of these versions here, and then you can sort of decide what you want to do. And I'll tell you exactly what I'm doing. So we'll do this right here. Okay? Actually, what I also want to do is cut this guy in half. There we go. So now we have some options here. So now it just basically comes down to how you're going to get the peel off this thing without hurting yourself. Now, um, let me show you on one of these. Now, if you have one of these Danish peelers and you're comfortable with it, you cannot use an American peeler this way, you will cut yourself, because this thing is designed with smaller gaps. The American peelers will eat your thumb if you try to do this, so don't do that. If you have a European peeler, you can go ahead and do it this way. 
but you have to be comfortable using your peeler because you can hurt yourself even with these guys. Okay, so I do this because I know what I'm doing, but I really don't, unless you grew up with one of these, I don't really recommend you pursue it. Um, the American version, which I can sort of show you with this peeler here, is to peel away from yourself. But this peeler wasn't meant for that, so, you know, it's not that good for that purpose. But a good American peeler, like those OXO grip things or whatever they are, um, I've done it with them and they, they work pretty well. Even the cheap ones, you know, the cheap ones that have that hole in the handle that are sort of jingly, they're fine too. I've used one of those last week on my neighbors showing him how to do this, so that those are fine too. But if you don't have, the, if you're not comfortable with either of these two systems, then here's what you do. You cut the squash in smaller pieces like this one, smaller slices, and then you just basically go around the edge and take it off like this. And it really isn't that bad once you get into the system of it. But that's why you want slices that aren't too tall. Like you don't want to be doing that on something like this because that's just a pain in the butt. And you can see anytime you have a curve like this, it's harder to do this. You want straight down if you're doing the system. So with this thing, just cut it in a couple more pieces and then you can go around doing this. You might even be able to peel it off like doing this way, you know, if you have something that's fairly straight. So, um, so whichever, whichever method you prefer, you just need to make sure you have pieces that you can grip nicely. You don't want this to slip and get the knife and close to your finger. So that was pretty easy, I mean, really. So uh, my normal system is to use this Danish peeler, so I'm going to attack these pieces doing that. But uh, I think you have a pretty good idea now what you can or can't do with this stuff. And of course the peel goes on the compost, feeds the earthworms, and makes dirt for you all for free. So you can grow your plants and vegetables in good soil. So it all goes around. Huh? Nature is a beautiful thing. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get this cut up for you. And then uh, when we're done with that, we'll show you how to cube it. And then we'll get the, get the soup going. Okay, so about five minutes for me, because I've done about ten of these in the past. So. Yes, we have only eaten this soup for about a year, actually. Um, but there'll be many more to come. So I've, I've done about 10 of these squashes. You get better at it as you go. Uh, if it takes you 10 or 15 minutes, that's fine. It's still a pretty easy way to cook dinner. So uh, make some cuts about this size here. Something like this. That size. And then sort of like that. That'll do it. I wouldn't cut them too much on top of each other in the beginning at least because um, I can do it now but you need to kind of be comfortable with stuff slipping so um, until then just cut one at a time see how it slips so um, that's that and then you have these other weird ones here sort of the same system and these I don't stack because they're too scary um, so you just do them like that it's not, a, not an exact science here. The goal is just to get these cut so we can get them done. However, if you're going to put them in the freezer, though, this is this is this is the stuff you'd put in the freezer. So you just prepare the squashes and take these guys and put them in a Ziploc and pop them in the freezer, and then they're ready to go when you need to make your soup in the future. So uh, if you're into preparing ahead, then that's what you would do. I, I kind of like to keep the keep the squashes intact just because I think, as far as food value, they may retain a little more uh, on their own if if you just, you know, leave them intact until you actually cook them. I mean, you might lose a little by freezing them. I don't know for sure. Uh, but if you have the option, I would just keep the, keep the squash intact. So um, we're going to process all these. And in the meantime, I just want to show you. You can get your water going. I have about two cups here of hot water. Whoops. And I'll put one more cup in. But uh, what we're going to do in the meantime here is, as well you cut this up, you can make your bouillon ready. So it looks like that. This big one is from Costco. It's a, a whopping, what is it? A pound, actually. And it lasts forever. I mean, just keep it in the refrigerator, though. So we're going to put a, uh, let's see how much we put, I forget how much it's we put in. It's a teaspoon per cup. Okay. Put a Everything in New York is so tight, you always have to search for things. This is the drawer with everything, the everything drawer. Everything you need, whenever you need it. Okay, so uh, according to uh, the measurements on this thing, it's a cup 
a cup, a, a, spoon, a teaspoon per cup. So we're going to go ahead and put three of these in, and then I'll be adding one more cup of water. So we'll have three cups of water and three teaspoons of bouillon in here. And in addition to that, we'll be putting about two or three cups more water in. Because the squash actually has plenty of flavor all by itself. We're not trying to, it's not trying to create stock here. I mean, you, you, this is additional because the squash itself has plenty of flavors. I mean, if you're like vegan or something, you, you could probably still benefit from this soup without putting, putting bouillon in there. So there we go. So we'll go ahead and cook up one more cup of water to make this three cups of water to about three te uh, teaspoons of bouillon. And then I'll go ahead and cut the rest of the squash and then we'll catch up with you when we're done with that. So here we are. We have the squash cut up. And you know, just since we have two in the house here, actually we have four, but I'm just showing you two. Uh, this became that. And I'm always kind of impressed by how much butternut squash you get out of a squash because it doesn't actually look like you're going to get that much when you look at this thing but the peel is so minuscule and the seeds are so nothing that you really are getting a lot of bang for your buck when you buy these you're not paying for a lot of roughage that you don't use um, and then I took the, um, the little whiskey and just mixed up the uh, three teaspoons of bouillon and three cups of hot water so that's ready to go um, and then we're going to cut up this onion and then we'll catch up with you when it's time to put everything in the pot all right, so ready for everything to go in the pot. If you like onion a lot, I mean, you can do double. You know, it, as I said, it doesn't really matter. You can adjust this to to your taste. You can also experiment with putting a little garlic in there. We do that sometimes. Uh, what we're going to do with this one is we're going to we're going to show you two ways of eating it. So we're not going to put garlic in quite yet uh, for this one, just because we want to keep it a little bit neutral. Because we we'll want to show you how you can take it into sort of a nutmeg uh, half and half direction. Or you can take sort of a West Indian direction and go the other way and put uh, cayenne pepper and coconut milk, homemade coconut milk. It's very, very nice in this stuff. So we have sort of the sort of conventional northeast, uh, northeast version of butternut squash, and then we have sort of the out to sea uh, version of butternut squash. It's a fairly new one we we did with the coconut milk and cayenne pepper, but it is the bomb. It is delicious. Uh, we do put a little bit of butter in with the onion. Uh, you could use olive oil too, I guess, but for this we like to put a little bit of butter. This is uh, Organic Valley's pasture butter, which comes out um, after the... Uh, it's a May to September thing, where they, they have uh, really good summer grass that, that the cows are on, so it, it makes a better uh, butter with higher omega-3 uh, fats in it. And that's, uh, of course, very good for you. So we tend to go for the, uh, the green packages. In fact, I have about 20 of these in the freezer. Because there was a sale last month, and I went for it. So, because um, you do need butter sometimes for things. So we're going to put some butter in here for the onion. Whoops, there we go. And then we'll go ahead and turn that on and get that going. Let's see here. There we go. And so we'll just saute the onions till they, you know, a little glassy. It's the usual rule. And uh, it's a very easy dish, easy, easy dish to make. And you don't need to cook this terribly long. That's the beauty of it. You know, it it's not one of those... You know, I mean, once you cook stuff for more than half an hour, you're really starting to lose the food value. It's just the way it is. You know, it, especially vegetables and things. You, know, you oxidize, you, you drain stuff out of them. It, it, it's not a good idea. You, know, you really should try to keep your cooking to a minimum. And it's good for people that are busy and don't have a lot of time because, frankly, the healthiest food is stuff that didn't cook that long. Uh, raw is obviously the best, but you can't be chewing on salads every single day unless you're like a raw food purist. You know, some of us actually do like a little bit of warmth once in a while when it's 30 degrees outside, Fahrenheit. Um, so here we are. Go ahead and put these onions in here. Give them a little trip through the butter. And then we're going to let them turn into the little glassy look. It usually takes a few minutes, so we're not going to bore you with that. We'll come back to you when we're ready to assemble the rest of it. So we'll, uh, we'll 
we'll uh, stick this on a little more heat to get it cooking and then uh, keep an eye on it and in about 20 minutes we'll get back to you and then we'll finish off the job. We're back and it, it's been about 20-30 minutes. Yeah. I tried to tell the truth. I think it's been 25 minutes or so, 30 minutes. Anyway, the lid has been on the whole time, of course. That's how you do soup. And I um, just want to let you know, it's on a very low flame. You know, for people that aren't used to cooking soup, you don't need much flame to get things going. Once the water boils, it's going. So it's barely on. Like, barely. Um, so it's pretty inexpensive as far as energy goes. Uh, anyway, what you want to do is you want to just mash it with a fork like that. And that tells you it's done. Like, just, if it mashes up like that, you're absolutely finished. So there's no reason to cook this for hours you now. It's done. So, um, since we're going to be using either an immersion blender or a blender blender, we don't want to put something this hot in there because a lot of blenders are made of plastic. You don't want to be putting hot stuff in there. Um, and immersion blenders are, have their own issues with stuff that's too hot. So, besides, you don't want to have any accidents that cause you to burn yourself. So, we're going to turn this off and leave the lid off and just leave it to cool off for maybe 5-10 minutes. And then we'll get back to you and show you how to actually turn this into that wonderful soup. Because it'll be completely wonderful when we get that mixed up. So until then, cheers and more shalom. Okay, so we've had a chance to cool off a little bit so we don't end up with an accident should we get this thing out of control. Uh, you have two options. Okay, you can either... If you don't have an immersion blender, which makes it easy because you can do it right in the pot, um, you can take this and just scoop it out. You know, grab a ladle of some sort, scoop it out, and put it in your uh, regular blender, and then just blend it. The, the key is just to mix up the stuff. It's fairly soft, but you still need to you know, crank up the machinery to get it done right. Uh, if you're going to do it in a blender, don't fill it up all the way. Yeah? I mean, just leave a little space so you don't have the lid coming off on you. Maybe do two batches. Um, we're going to use this immersion blender here for the job. Just keep this toward the bottom. If you lift it too much, you're going to have it all. Over. Now you see, that's a butternut squash soup right there. So what we're going to do now is just have a little taste and see how the salty, see how the salt factor is, because that's what we were going to check out after the fact. And it needs some salt. So we'll put that spoon away, put some salt in here. And it really depends on your taste, you know. You can always leave a little salt out and just salt it when you eat it, you know, to make sure. But I know for a fact we're going to need probably this much. So we'll try that again. this up and showing you how to snazz it up a little further. It's good as it is, but we're going to tell you how to give it a little extra kick. Alright, so we've served up the soup. Uh, I'll show you over here too. This is what was left over, so we have two bowls of soup so far, and then this is what's left over. So it's a pretty good uh, hefty amount of soup. Also, uh, if you don't cook it with as much water as it could officially take, you get a thicker soup, and that's actually nice for storage in the fridge because then it takes up less space if you have less space in your fridge like we often do in the cities. Uh, and then when you actually go to make the soup, I just added a little hot water to both of these because ours does get a little thick because we only have that three quart pot to work with. So just add a little water when you get ready to serve it and then you know you'll have the soup the right the right consistency. Now there are two versions. 
I'll first off say uh, salt and pepper, and that should be on the table just so people can take whatever they need. There are two versions that we sort of can take this soup in. The original version that we used to do involves taking a little nutmeg, this nutmeg, whole nutmeg, and a little grater like this, and you just grate right on the soup. Yeah, so you can just do as much or as little as you like, right? But uh, nutmeg is very nice in these soups. With nutmeg, you would want to use something like half and half or cream. We don't because we don't believe in pasteurized dairy anymore, so this is the imaginary cream pitcher right here. If you're still drinking pasteurized dairy, that's up to you, but uh, that would be the right thing to put in with nutmeg, I would say. Um, so that's up to you. The, uh, the newer version that we've adopted uh, this year involves uh, it's more, more of a sort of a West Indian twist inspired by a pumpkin dish in a West Indian restaurant. This, this comes close to pumpkin. Um, so what we do here is we take some some uh, little cayenne pepper here. I'm just going to stick my fingers into it. Cayenne pepper. Don't be shy. And you can give this as much of a, or a little of, of a bite as you want. I wouldn't put the cayenne pepper in up front unless you're going to eat the whole thing because everybody's uh, needs for spice vary. So just do it at the table. And then uh, this is some homemade coconut milk that I made while the soup was cooking on the stove for that half hour. I went ahead and made a jar of fresh coconut milk from shredded coconut. There's another video on Mork Saloon's uh, YouTube channel that shows you how to easily make your own coconut milk. Um, so we'll take some of this and put it in. And coconut milk is so rich that you actually don't need a lot to make it nice and creamy. So that's how that works. And so we'll show you how you kind of, we tend to mix it all in, kind of stir it up and mix it in. You get a really nice creamy soup that really is enough for dinner by all by itself. And if you make a pot like this, I mean, you have you can keep that in the fridge for three, four days. You know, you make it on a Sunday and you have good food to come home to after work the whole week. So here we go. Let's see. Oh yeah, you ought to make this, folks. This is really good. Signing off here from Mark Salone.